French Algeria French, Alger to 1839, then Algerie afterwards, and officially Algerie Française, Arabic, al jazair al farinchia also known as Colonial Algeria Arabic, al jazair al musta mara was the colonial rule of France over Algeria. French colonial rule in Algeria began in 1830 with the invasion of Algiers which ended the Barbary slave trade and lasted until 1962, under a variety of governmental systems. From 1848 until independence, the whole Mediterranean region of Algeria was administered as an integral part of France. One of France's longest held overseas territories, Algeria became a destination for hundreds of thousands of European immigrants known as colons and, later, as pieds noirs. However, the indigenous Muslim population remained a majority of the territory's population throughout its history. Gradually, dissatisfaction among the Muslim population with its lack of political and economic status fueled calls for greater political autonomy, and eventually independence from France. Tensions between the two population groups came to a head in 1954, when the first violent events began of what was later called the Algerian War, characterized by guerrilla warfare and illegal methods used by the French in order to put down the revolt. The war concluded in 1962, when Algeria gained independence following the March 1962 Evian Agreements and the July 1962 Self-Determination Referendum. During its last years of existence, French Algeria was, as a part of France, a founding member state of the United Nations, NATO, and the European Economic Community later the European Union. Topic History Topic Initial Conflicts Since the 1516 capture of Algiers by the Ottoman admirals, the brothers Ars and Haradine Barbarossa, Algeria had been a base for conflict and piracy in the Mediterranean. In 1681, Louis XIV asked Admiral Abraham Duquesne to fight the Berber pirates and also ordered a large-scale attack on Algiers between 1682 and 1683 on the pretext of assisting Christian captives. Again, Jean II d'Estres bombarded Tripoli and Algiers from 1685 to 1688. An ambassador from Algiers visited the court in Versailles, and a treaty was signed in 1690 that provided peace throughout the 18th century. During the Directory regime of the First French Republic (1795–99), the Bakri and the Busnak, Jewish negotiators of Algiers, provided important quantities of grain for Napoleon's soldiers who participated in the Italian campaign of 1796. However, Bonaparte refused to pay the bill back, claiming it was excessive. In 1820, Louis XVIII paid back half of the Directory's debts. The Day, who had loaned to the Bakri 250,000 francs, requested from France the rest of the money. The Day of Algiers himself was weak politically, economically, and militarily. Algeria was then part of the Barbary states, along with today's Tunisia, which depended on the Ottoman Empire then led by Mahmud II, but enjoyed relative independence. The Barbary coast was then the stronghold of the Berber pirates, which carried out raids against European and American ships. Conflicts between the Barbary states and the newly independent United States of America culminated in the first 1801 and second 1815 Barbary Wars. An Anglo-Dutch force, led by Admiral Lord Exmouth, carried out a punitive expedition, the August 1816 bombardment of Algiers. The day was forced to sign the Barbary Treaties, while the technological advance of U.S., British, and French forces overwhelmed the Algerians' expertise at naval warfare. The name of Algeria itself came from the French. Following the conquest under the July Monarchy, the Algerian territories, disputed with the Ottoman Empire, were first named 
French possessions in North Africa, before being called Algeria by Marshal General Jean de Dieu Soult, Duke of Dalmatia, in 1839. Topic. French conquest of Algeria The conquest of Algeria was initiated in the last days of the Bourbon Restoration by Charles X, as an attempt to increase his popularity amongst the French people, particularly in Paris, where many veterans of the Napoleonic Wars lived. His intention was to bolster patriotic sentiment, and distract attention from ineptly handled domestic policies by skirmishing against the day. Fly-whisk incident April 1827. In the 1790s, France had contracted to purchase wheat for the French army from two merchants in Algiers, Messrs. Bakri and Bauchnik, and was in arrears paying them. These merchants, Bakri and Bauchnik who had debts to the day, claimed inability to pay those debts until France paid its debts to them. The day had unsuccessfully negotiated with Pierre Duval, the French consul, to rectify this situation, and he suspected Duval of collaborating with the merchants against him, especially when the French government made no provisions for repaying the merchants in 1820. Duval's nephew Alexander, the consul in Bonn, further angered the day by fortifying French storehouses in Bonn and La Calle against the terms of prior agreements. After a contentious meeting in which Duval refused to provide satisfactory answers on the 29th of April 1827, the day struck Duval with his fly whisk. Charles X used this slight against his diplomatic representative to first demand an apology from the day, and then to initiate a blockade against the port of Algiers. France demanded that the day send an ambassador to France to resolve the incident. When the day responded with cannon fire directed toward one of the blockading ships, the French determined that more forceful action was required. Topic. Invasion of Algiers June 1830. Pierre Duval and other French residents of Algiers left for France, while the Minister of War, Claire Montagnier, proposed a military expedition. However, the Count of Villele, an ultra-royalist, president of the council and the monarch's heir, opposed any military action. The Restoration finally decided to blockade Algiers for three years. Meanwhile, the Berber pirates were able to exploit the geography of the coast with ease. Before the failure of the blockade, the Restoration decided on 31 January 1830 to engage a military expedition against Algiers. Admiral de Pere commandeered an armada of 600 ships that originated from Toulon, leading it to Algiers. Using Napoleon's 1808 contingency plan for the invasion of Algeria, General de Bermont then landed 27 kilometers (17 miles) west of Algiers at Sidi Farouche on the 14th of June 1830 with 34,000 soldiers. In response to the French, the Algerian Day ordered an opposition consisting of 7,000 Janissaries, 19,000 troops from the bays of Constantine and Oran, and about 17,000 Kabyles. The French established a strong beachhead and pushed toward Algiers, thanks in part to superior artillery and better organization. The French troops took the advantage on 19 June during the Battle of Staweli, and entered Algiers on 5 July after a three-week campaign. The day agreed to surrender in exchange for his freedom and the offer to retain possession of his personal wealth. Five days later, he exiled himself with his family, departing on a French ship for the Italian peninsula, then under the control of the Austrian Empire. 2,500 Janissaries also quit the Algerian territories, heading for Asia, on the 11th of July. The day's departure ended 313 years of Ottoman rule of the territory. 
The French army then recruited the 1st Zouaves, a title given to certain light infantry regiments in October, followed by the Spahis regiments, while France expropriated all the land properties belonging to the Turkish settlers known as Belinks. In the western region of Oran, Sultan Abdurrahman of Morocco, the commander of the believers, could not remain indifferent to the massacres committed by the French Christian troops and to belligerent calls to enter jihad from the marabouts. Despite the diplomatic rupture between Morocco and the two Sicilies in 1830, and the naval warfare engaged against the Austrian Empire as well as with Spain, then headed by Ferdinand VII, Sultan Abdurrahman lent his support to the Algerian insurgency triggered by Abd el Kader. The latter would fight for years against the French. Directing an army of 12,000 men, Abd el Kader first organized the blockade of Oran. Algerian refugees were welcomed by the Moroccan population, while the Sultan recommended that the authorities of Tatouan assist them, by providing jobs in the administration or the military forces. The inhabitants of Tlemcen, close to the Moroccan border, asked that they be placed under the Sultan's authority in order to escape the invaders. Abdurrahman thus named his nephew, Prince Moulay Ali, as Caliph of Tlemcen, charged with the protection of the city. In retaliation France executed two Moroccans, Mohamed Belliano and Benkarain as spies, while their goods were seized by the military governor of Oran, General Boyer. Hardly had the news of the capture of Algiers reached Paris than Charles X was deposed during the three glorious days of July 1830, and his cousin Louis Philippe, the «citizen king», was named to preside over a constitutional monarchy. The new government, composed of liberal opponents of the Algiers expedition, was reluctant to pursue the conquest begun by the old regime, but withdrawing from Algeria proved more difficult than conquering it. Topic. Characterization as genocide Some governments and scholars have called France's conquest of Algeria a genocide for example. Ben Kiernan an Australian expert on the Cambodian genocide wrote in Blood and Soil, a world history of genocide and extermination from Sparta to Darfur on the French conquest of Algeria. By 1875, the French conquest was complete. The war had killed approximately 825,000 indigenous Algerians since 1830. A long shadow of genocidal hatred persisted, provoking a French author to protest in 1882 that in Algeria, we hear it repeated every day that we must expel the native and if necessary destroy him. As a French statistical journal urged five years late, the system of extermination must give way to a policy of penetration." Ben Kiernan, Blood and Soil In response to France's recognition of Armenian genocide, Turkey accused France of committing genocide against 15% of Algeria's population. Topic. Popular revolts against the French occupation Topic. Conquest of the Algerian territories under the July Monarchy 1830 On 1 December 1830, King Louis-Philippe named the Duc de Rovigo as head of military staff in Algeria. De Rogivo took control of Bone and initiated colonization of the land. He was recalled in 1833 due to the overtly violent nature of the repression. Wishing to avoid a conflict with Morocco, Louis Philippe sent an extraordinary mission to the Sultan, mixed with displays of military might, sending war ships to the Bay of Tangiers. An ambassador was sent to Sultan Moulay Abdurrahman in February 1832, headed by the Count of Mornay and including the painter Eugène Delacroix. The Sultan, however, refused French demands to evacuate Tlemcen. 
In 1834, France annexed as a colony the occupied areas of Algeria, which had an estimated Muslim population of about 2 million. Colonial administration in the occupied areas the so called regime du sabre, government of the sword was placed under a governor general, a high ranking army officer invested with civil and military jurisdiction, who was responsible to the Minister of War. Marshal Bugo, who became the first governor-general, headed the conquest. Soon after the conquest of Algiers, the soldier politician Bertrand Clozel and others formed a company to acquire agricultural land and, despite official discouragement, to subsidize its settlement by European farmers, triggering a land rush. Clozel recognized the farming potential of the Mitaja Plain and envisioned the large-scale production there of cotton. As Governor General 1835 he used his office to make private investments in land and encouraged army officers and bureaucrats in his administration to do the same. This development created a vested interest among government officials in greater French involvement in Algeria. Commercial interests with influence in the government also began to recognize the prospects for profitable land speculation in expanding the French zone of occupation. They created large agricultural tracts, built factories and businesses, and hired local labor. Among others' testimonies, Lieutenant Colonel Lucien de Montagnac wrote on 15 March 1843, in a letter to a friend, all populations who do not accept our conditions must be despoiled. Everything must be seized, devastated, without age or sex distinction. Grass must not grow any more where the French army has set foot. Who wants the end wants the means, whatever may say our philanthropists. I personally warn all good soldiers whom I have the honor to lead that if they happen to bring me a living Arab, they will receive a beating with the flat of the saber. This is how, my dear friend, we must make war against Arabs, kill all men over the age of fifteen, take all their women and children, load them onto naval vessels, send them to the Marquesas Islands or elsewhere. In one word, annihilate all who will not crawl beneath our feet like dogs. Whatever initial misgivings Louis Philippe's government may have had about occupying Algeria, the geopolitical realities of the situation created by the 1830 intervention argued strongly for reinforcing French presence there. France had reason for concern that Britain, which was pledged to maintain the territorial integrity of the Ottoman Empire, would move to fill the vacuum left by a French withdrawal. The French devised elaborate plans for settling the hinterland left by Ottoman provincial authorities in 1830, but their efforts at state building were unsuccessful on account of lengthy armed resistance. The most successful local opposition immediately after the fall of Algiers was led by Ahmad ibn Muhammad, Bey of Constantine. He initiated a radical overhaul of the Ottoman administration in his Beylik by replacing Turkish officials with local leaders, making Arabic the official language, and attempting to reform finances according to the precepts of Islam. After the French failed in several attempts to gain some of the Bey's territories through negotiation, an ill-fated invasion force, led by Bertrand Clozel, had to retreat from Constantine in 1836 in humiliation and defeat. However, the French captured Constantine under Sylvain Charles Vallée the following year, on 13 October 1837. Historians generally set the indigenous population of Algeria at one and a half million in 1830. Although the Algerian population decreased at some point under French rule, most certainly between 1866 and 1872, the French military was not responsible for the full extent of this decrease, as a fraction of these deaths could be explained by the locust plagues of 1866 and 1868, as well as by a rigorous winter in 1867-68, which caused a famine followed by an epidemic of cholera. Topic. Resistance of Lala Fadma Nasumer 
The French began their occupation of Algiers in 1830, starting with a landing in Algiers. As occupation turned into colonization, Kabylie remained the only region independent of the French government. Pressure on the region increased, and the will of her people to resist and defend Kabylie increased as well. A turning point in Lala Fadma's life was the arrival in Kabylie, in about 1849, of a mysterious man who presented himself as Muhammad ben Abdallah, the name of the prophet, but who is more commonly known as Bo Bagla. He was probably an ex lieutenant in the army of Amir Abdelkader, defeated for the last time by the French in 1847. Bo Bagla refused to surrender at that battle and retreated to Kabylie. From there he began a war against the French armies and their allies, often employing guerrilla tactics. Bo Bagla was a relentless fighter, and very eloquent in Arabic. He was very religious, and some legends tell about his thaumaturgic skills. Bo Bagla went often to summer to talk with the high-ranking members of the religious community, and Lala Fadma was soon attracted by his strong personality. At the same time, the relentless combatant was attracted by a woman so resolutely willing to contribute, by any means possible, to the war against the French. With her inspiring speeches, she convinced many men to fight as Imseblin volunteers ready to die as martyrs and she herself, together with other women, participated in combat by providing cooking, medicines, and comfort to the fighting forces. Traditional sources tell that a strong bond was formed between Lala Fadma and Bo Bagla. She saw this as a wedding of peers, rather than the traditional submission as a slave to a husband. In fact, at that time Bo Bagla left his first wife Fatima bent Sidi Aisa and sent back to her owner a slave he had as a concubine Halima bent Mesoud. But on her side, Lala Fadma wasn't free, even if she was recognized as Tamnafkut, woman who left her husband to get back to his family. A Kabylie institution, the matrimonial tie with her husband was still in place, and only her husband's will could free her. However he did not agree to, even when offered large bribes. The love between Fadma and Bo remained platonic, but there were public expressions of this feeling between the two. Fadma was personally present at many fights in which Bo Bagla was involved, particularly the Battle of Tachikert won by Bo Bagla forces 18-19 July 1854, where the French general Jacques-Louis César Randon was caught but managed to escape later. On 26 December 1854, Bo Bagla was killed, some sources claim it was due to the treason of some of his allies. The resistance remained without a charismatic leader and a commander able to guide it efficiently. For this reason, during the first months of 1855, on a sanctuary built on top of the Azru Nethor Peak, not far from the village where Fadma was born, there was a great council among combatants and important figures of the tribes in Kabylie. They decided to grant Lala Fadma, assisted by her brothers, the command of combat. Topic. Resistance of Emir Abd al-Qadir The French faced other opposition as well in the area. The superior of a religious brotherhood, Muhi ad-Din, who had spent time in Ottoman jails for opposing the Bey's rule, launched attacks against the French and their Mazen allies at Oran in 1832. In the same year, jihad was declared and to lead it tribal elders chose Muhi ad-Din's son, 25-year-old Abd al-Qadir. Abd al-Qadir, who was recognized as Amir al muminin commander of the faithful, quickly gained the support of tribes throughout Algeria. A devout and austere marabout, he was also a cunning political leader and a resourceful warrior. From his capital in Tlemcen, Abd al-Qadir set about building a territorial Muslim state based on the communities of the interior but drawing its strength from the tribes and religious brotherhoods. By 1839, he controlled more than two-thirds of Algeria. 
His government maintained an army and a bureaucracy, collected taxes, supported education, undertook public works, and established agricultural and manufacturing cooperatives to stimulate economic activity. The French in Algiers viewed with concern the success of a Muslim government and the rapid growth of a viable territorial state that barred the extension of European settlement. Abd al-Qadir fought running battles across Algeria with French forces, which included units of the Foreign Legion, organized in 1831 for Algerian service. Although his forces were defeated by the French under General Thomas Bougo in 1836, Abd al-Qadir negotiated a favorable peace treaty the next year. The Treaty of Tafna gained conditional recognition for Abd al-Qadir's regime by defining the territory under its control and salvaged his prestige among the tribes just as the sheikhs were about to desert him. To provoke new hostilities, the French deliberately broke the treaty in 1839 by occupying Constantine. Abd al-Qadir took up the holy war again, destroyed the French settlements on the Mitaja plain, and at one point advanced to the outskirts of Algiers itself. He struck where the French were weakest and retreated when they advanced against him in greater strength. The government moved from camp to camp with the emir and his army. Gradually, however, superior French resources and manpower and the defection of tribal chieftains took their toll. Reinforcements poured into Algeria after 1840 until Bougo had at his disposal 108,000 men, one-third of the French army. One by one, the emir's strongholds fell to the French, and many of his ablest commanders were killed or captured so that by 1843 the Muslim state had collapsed. Abd al-Qadir took refuge in 1841 with his ally, the Sultan of Morocco, Abd ar rahman II, and launched raids into Algeria. This alliance led the French navy to bombard and briefly occupy Asora Mogador under the Prince de Joinville on August 16, 1844. A French force was destroyed at the Battle of Sidi Brahim in 1845. However, Abd al-Qadir was obliged to surrender to the commander of Oran province, General Louis de la Mauricière, at the end of 1847. Abd al-Qadir was promised safe conduct to Egypt or Palestine if his followers laid down their arms and kept the peace. He accepted these conditions, but the Minister of War, who years earlier as general in Algeria had been badly defeated by Abd al-Qadir, had him consigned in France in the Château d'Amboise. <inaudible> French rule Demography <inaudible> 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 Hegemony of the colons A commission of inquiry established by the French Senate in 1892 and headed by former Premier Jules Ferry, an advocate of colonial expansion, recommended that the government abandon a policy that assumed French law, without major modifications, could fit the needs of an area inhabited by close to 2 million Europeans and 4 million Muslims. Muslims had no representation in the French National Assembly before 1945 and were grossly underrepresented on local councils. Because of the many restrictions imposed by the authorities, by 1915 only 50,000 Muslims were eligible to vote in elections in the civil communes. Attempts to implement even the most modest reforms were blocked or delayed by the local administration in Algeria, dominated by colons, and by the 27 colon representatives in the National Assembly six deputies and three senators from each department. Once elected to the National Assembly, colons became permanent fixtures. Because of their seniority, they exercised disproportionate influence, and their support was important to any government's survival. 
The leader of the Colon delegation, Auguste Warnier (1810–1875), succeeded during the 1870s in modifying or introducing legislation to facilitate the private transfer of land to settlers and continue the Algerian state's appropriation of land from the local population and distribution to settlers. Consistent proponents of reform, like Georges Clemenceau and socialist Jean Jaurès, were rare in the National Assembly. The bulk of Algeria's wealth in manufacturing, mining, agriculture, and trade was controlled by the Grand Colons. The modern European-owned and managed sector of the economy centered on small industry and a highly developed export trade, designed to provide food and raw materials to France in return for capital and consumer goods. Europeans held about 30% of the total arable land, including the bulk of the most fertile land and most of the areas under irrigation. By 1900, Europeans produced more than two-thirds of the value of output in agriculture and practically all agricultural exports. The modern, or European, sector was run on a commercial basis and meshed with the French market system that it supplied with wine, citrus, olives, and vegetables. Nearly half of the value of European-owned real property was in vineyards by 1914. By contrast, subsistence cereal production—supplemented by olive, fig, and date growing and stock raising—formed the basis of the traditional sector, but the land available for cropping was submarginal even for cereals under prevailing traditional cultivation practices. The colonial regime imposed more and higher taxes on Muslims than on Europeans. The Muslims, in addition to paying traditional taxes dating from before the French conquest, also paid new taxes, from which the colons were normally exempted. In 1909, for instance, Muslims, who made up almost 90% of the population but produced 20% of Algeria's income, paid 70% of direct taxes and 45% of the total taxes collected and colons controlled how these revenues would be spent. As a result, colon towns had handsome municipal buildings, paved streets lined with trees, fountains and statues, while Algerian villages and rural areas benefited little if at all from tax revenues. The colonial regime proved severely detrimental to overall education for Algerian Muslims, who had previously relied on religious schools to learn reading, writing, and engage in religious studies. Not only did the state appropriate the Habu's lands, the religious foundations that constituted the main source of income for religious institutions, including schools, in 1843, but Colon officials refused to allocate enough money to maintain schools and mosques properly and to provide for enough teachers and religious leaders for the growing population. In 1892, more than five times as much was spent for the education of Europeans as for Muslims, who had five times as many children of school age. Because few Muslim teachers were trained, Muslim schools were largely staffed by French teachers. Even a state-operated madrasa school often had French faculty members. Attempts to institute bilingual, bicultural schools, intended to bring Muslim and European children together in the classroom, were a conspicuous failure, rejected by both communities and phased out after 1870. According to one estimate, fewer than 5% of Algerian children attended any kind of school in 1870. As late as 1954 only one Muslim boy in five and one girl in 16 was receiving formal schooling. Efforts were begun by 1890 to educate a small number of Muslims along with European students in the French school system as part of France's civilizing mission in Algeria. The curriculum was entirely French and allowed no place for Arabic studies, which were deliberately downgraded even in Muslim schools. Within a generation, a class of well-educated, gallicized Muslims—the Evolues literally, the evolved ones—had been created. 
Almost all of the handful of Muslims who accepted French citizenship were Evolues. Ironically, this privileged group of Muslims, strongly influenced by French culture and political attitudes, developed a new Algerian self consciousness. Reporting to the French Senate in 1894, Governor General Jules Cambon wrote that Algeria had only a dust of people left her. He referred to the destruction of the traditional ruling class that had left Muslims without leaders and had deprived France of interlocutors valables literally, valid go-betweens, through whom to reach the masses of the people. He lamented that no genuine communication was possible between the two communities. The colons who ran Algeria maintained a dialogue only with the Beni Wiwis. Later they thwarted contact between the Evolues and Muslim traditionalists on the one hand and between Evolues and official circles in France on the other. They feared and mistrusted the Francophone Evolues, who were classified either as assimilationist, insisting on being accepted as Frenchmen but on their own terms, or as integrationists, eager to work as members of a distinct Muslim elite on equal terms with the French. Topic. Discrimination Following its conquest of Ottoman-controlled Algeria in 1830, for well over a century France maintained what was effectively colonial rule in the territory, though the French constitution of 1848 made Algeria part of France, and Algeria was usually understood as such by French people, even on the left. Algeria became the prototype for a pattern of French colonial rule which has been described as quasi-apartheid. When French rule began, France had no well-established systems for intensive colonial governance, the main existing legal provision being the 1685 Code Noir, which focused on slave trading and owning. From 1830, Algerians were not French citizens, nor did they have a mechanism to become citizens. As French rule in Algeria expanded, particularly under Thomas Robert Bougot (1841–48), discriminatory governance became increasingly formalized. In 1844, Bougot formalized a system of European settlements along the coast, under civil government, with Arab, Berber areas in the interior under military governance. An important feature of French rule was cantonment, whereby tribal land that was supposedly unused was seized by the state, which enabled French colonists to expand their landholdings, pushing indigenous people onto more marginal land and making them more vulnerable to drought. This was extended under the governance of Bougot's successor, Jacques Louis Randon. In the 1860s, Napoleon III, influenced by Ismail Urbain, introduced what were intended as liberalizing reforms in Algeria, promoting the French colonial model of assimilation, whereby colonized peoples would eventually become French. His reforms were resisted by colonists in Algeria, and his attempts to allow Muslims to be elected to a putative new assembly in Paris failed. However, he oversaw an 1865 decree that stipulated that all the colonized indigenous were under French jurisdiction, i.e., French nationals subjected to French laws, and allowed Arab, Jewish, and Berber Algerians to request French citizenship—but only if they «renounced their Muslim religion and culture». Azadine Hador argues that this established «the formal structures of a political apartheid». Since few people were willing to abandon their religious values which was seen as apostasy, rather than promoting assimilation, the legislation had the opposite effect. By 1913, only 1,557 Muslims had been granted French citizenship. In 1870, the French government granted Algerian Jews French citizenship under the Cremieux Decree, but not Muslims. This meant that most Algerians were now French subjects, treated as the objects of French law, but were not citizens, could not vote, and were effectively without the right to citizenship. Jewish people's citizenship was revoked by the Vichy government in the early 1940s, but was restored in 1943. 
In 1881, the Code de l'Indigenat was formally introduced, enabling district officials to issue summary punishments to Muslims without due legal process, and to extract special taxes and forced labor. In 1909, 70% of all direct taxes in Algeria were paid by Muslims. Despite their general poverty, opportunities for Muslims improved slightly from the 1890s, particularly for urban elites, which helped ensure acquiescence to the introduction of military conscription for Muslims in 1911. Despite periodic attempts at partial reform, the situation of the Code de l'Indigenat persisted until the French Fourth Republic, which began in 1946, but although Muslim Algerians were accorded the rights of citizenship, the system of discrimination was maintained in more informal ways. Frederick Cooper writes that Muslim Algerians were still marginalized in their own territory, notably the separate voter roles of French civil status and of Muslim civil status to keep their hands on power. This «internal system of apartheid» met with considerable resistance from the Muslims affected by it, and is cited as one of the causes of the 1954 insurrection. <laughs> <laughs> Government and administration Initial settling of Algeria 1830 In November 1830, French colonial officials attempted to limit the arrivals at Algerian ports by requiring the presentation of passports and residence permits. The regulations created by the French government in May 1831 required permission from the Interior Ministry to enter Algeria and other French-controlled territories. This May circular allowed merchants with trading interests easy access to passports because they were not permanent settlers and wealthy persons who planned on founding agricultural enterprises in Algeria were also freely given access to move. The circular forbid the passage of indigents and needy unskilled workers. During the 1840s, the French government assisted certain immigrants to Algeria, who were mostly urban workers from the Paris Basin and France's eastern frontier and were not the agricultural workers that the colonial officials wanted to be sent from France. Single men received 68% of the free passages and only 14% of the emigrants were women because of varying policies about the emigration of families that all favored unaccompanied males who were seen as more flexible and useful for laborious tasks. Initially in November 1840, families were eligible only if they had no small children and two-thirds of the family was able to work. Later, in September 1841, only unaccompanied males could travel to Algeria for free and a complicated system for families was developed that made subsidized travel almost unavailable. These immigrants were offered many different forms of government assistance including free passages both to the ports of France and by ship to Algeria, wine rations and food, land concessions, and promised high wages. Between 1841 and 1845, about 20,000 individuals were offered this assisted emigration by the French government, though it is unknown exactly how many actually went to Algeria. These measures were funded and supported by the French government, both local officials and national, because they saw the move to Algeria as a solution to overpopulation and unemployment. Those who applied for assisted emigration emphasized their work ethics, undeserved employment in France, a presumption of government obligation to the less fortunate. By 1848, Algeria was populated by 109,400 Europeans, only 42,274 of which were French. Topic: <laughs> Colonization and military control. A royal ordinance in 1845 called for three types of administration in Algeria. 
In areas where Europeans were a substantial part of the population, Colons elected mayors and councils for self-governing, full exercise, communes, communes de plain exercise. In the mixed communes, where Muslims were a large majority, government was in the hands of appointed and some elected officials, including representatives of the grand chefs, great chieftains, and a French administrator. The indigenous communes, communes indigenes, remote areas not adequately pacified, remained under the regime du sabre, rule of the sword. By 1848, nearly all of northern Algeria was under French control. Important tools of the colonial administration, from this time until their elimination in the 1870s, were the Bureau Arabes Arab offices, staffed by Arabists whose function was to collect information on the indigenous people and to carry out administrative functions, nominally in cooperation with the army. The Bureau Arabes on occasion acted with sympathy to the local population and formed a buffer between Muslims and colons. Under the regime du sabre, the colons had been permitted limited self-government in areas where European settlement was most intense, but there was constant friction between them and the army. The colons charged that the Bureau Arabes hindered the progress of colonization. They agitated against military rule, complaining that their legal rights were denied under the arbitrary controls imposed on the colony and insisting on a civil administration for Algeria fully integrated with metropolitan France. The army warned that the introduction of civilian government would invite Muslim retaliation and threaten the security of Algeria. The French government vacillated in its policy, yielding small concessions to the Colon demands on the one hand while maintaining the regime du sabre to control the Muslim majority on the other. Topic. Under the French Second Republic and Second Empire 1848-70 Shortly after Louis Philippe's constitutional monarchy was overthrown in the Revolution of 1848, the new government of the Second Republic ended Algeria's status as a colony and declared in the 1848 constitution the occupied lands an integral part of France. Three civil territories Alger, Oran, and Constantine were organized as departments of France local administrative units under a civilian government. This made them a part of France proper as opposed to a colony. For the first time, French citizens in the civil territories elected their own councils and mayors. Muslims had to be appointed, could not hold more than one-third of council seats, and could not serve as mayors or assistant mayors. The administration of territories outside the zone settled by colons remained under the French army. Local Muslim administration was allowed to continue under the supervision of French army commanders, charged with maintaining order in newly pacified regions, and the Bureau Arabes. Theoretically, these areas were closed to European colonization. Topic. Land and colonizers Even before the decision was made to annex Algeria, major changes had taken place. In a bargain hunting frenzy to take over or buy at low prices all manner of property homes, shops, farms, and factories Europeans poured into Algiers after it fell. French authorities took possession of the Beylik lands, from which Ottoman officials had derived income. Over time, as pressures increased to obtain more land for settlement by Europeans, the state seized more categories of land, particularly that used by tribes, religious foundations, and villages. Called either colons, settlers, Algerians, or later, especially following the 1962 independence of Algeria, pied noirs, literally, black feet, the European settlers were largely of peasant farmer or working class origin from the poor southern areas of Italy, Spain, and France. Others were criminal and political deportees from France, transported under sentence in large numbers to Algeria. 
In the 1840s and 1850s, to encourage settlement in rural areas, official policy was to offer grants of land for a fee and a promise that improvements would be made. A distinction soon developed between the Grand Colons great settlers at one end of the scale, often self-made men who had accumulated large estates or built successful businesses, and smallholders and workers at the other end, whose lot was often not much better than that of their Muslim counterparts. According to historian John Rudy, although by 1848 only 15,000 of the 109,000 European settlers were in rural areas. By systematically expropriating both pastoralists and farmers, rural colonization was the most important single factor in the destructuring of traditional society. European migration, encouraged during the Second Republic, stimulated the civilian administration to open new land for settlement against the advice of the army. With the advent of the Second Empire in 1852, Napoleon III returned Algeria to military control. In 1858 a separate Ministry of Algerian Affairs was created to supervise administration of the country through a military governor-general assisted by a civil minister. Napoleon III visited Algeria twice in the early 1860s. He was profoundly impressed with the nobility and virtue of the tribal chieftains, who appealed to the emperor's romantic nature, and was shocked by the self-serving attitude of the colon leaders. He decided to halt the expansion of European settlement beyond the coastal zone and to restrict contact between Muslims and the colons, whom he considered to have a corrupting influence on the indigenous population. He envisioned a grand design for preserving most of Algeria for the Muslims by founding a Roy Omarabe Arab Kingdom with himself as the Roy de Arabes King of the Arabs. He instituted the so-called politics of the Grand Chefs to deal with the Muslims directly through their traditional leaders. To further his plans for the Royal Marabe, Napoleon III issued two decrees affecting tribal structure, land tenure, and the legal status of Muslims in French Algeria. The first, promulgated in 1863, was intended to renounce the state's claims to tribal lands and eventually provide private plots to individuals in the tribes, thus dismantling feudal structures and protecting the lands from the colons. Tribal areas were to be identified, delimited into dwars, administrative units, and given over to councils. Arable land was to be divided among members of the doer over a period of one to three generations, after which it could be bought and sold by the individual owners. Unfortunately for the tribes, however, the plans of Napoleon III quickly unraveled. French officials sympathetic to the colons took much of the tribal land they surveyed into the public domain. In addition, some tribal leaders immediately sold communal lands for quick gains. The process of converting arable land to individual ownership was accelerated to only a few years when laws were enacted in the 1870s stipulating that no sale of land by an individual Muslim could be invalidated by the claim that it was collectively owned. The Kuda and other tribal officials, appointed by the French on the basis of their loyalty to France rather than the allegiance owed them by the tribe, lost their credibility as they were drawn into the European orbit, becoming known derisively as Beni Wi Wi. Napoleon III visualized three distinct Algerias a French colony, an Arab country, and a military camp, each with a distinct form of local government. The second decree, issued in 1865, was designed to recognize the differences in cultural background of the French and the Muslims. As French nationals, Muslims could serve on equal terms in the French armed forces and civil service and could migrate to France proper. They were also granted the protection of French law while retaining the right to adhere to Islamic law in litigation concerning their personal status. But if Muslims wished to become full citizens, they had to accept the full jurisdiction of the French legal code, including laws affecting marriage and inheritance, and reject the authority of the religious courts. 
In effect, this meant that a Muslim had to renounce some of the mores of his religion in order to become a French citizen. This condition was bitterly resented by Muslims, for whom the only road to political equality was perceived to be apostasy. Over the next century, fewer than 3,000 Muslims chose to cross the barrier and become French citizens. A similar status applied to the Jewish natives. Topic. Under the Third Republic 1870 When the Prussians captured Napoleon III at the Battle of Sedan 1870, ending the Second Empire, demonstrations in Algiers by the Colons led to the departure of the just-arrived new Governor-General and the replacement of the military administration by settler committees. Meanwhile, in France the government of the Third Republic directed one of its ministers, Adolphe Cremieux, to destroy the military regime and to completely assimilate Algeria into France. In October 1870, Cremieux, whose concern with Algerian affairs dated from the time of the Second Republic, issued a series of decrees providing for representation of the Algerian département in the National Assembly of France and confirming colon control over local administration. A civilian governor-general was made responsible to the Ministry of Interior. The Cremieux decrees also granted full French citizenship to Algerian Jews, who then numbered about 40,000. This act set them apart from Muslims, in whose eyes they were identified thereafter with the Colons. The measure had to be enforced, however, over the objections of the Colons, who made little distinction between Muslims and Jews. Automatic citizenship was subsequently extended in 1889 to children of non-French Europeans born in Algeria unless they specifically rejected it. The loss of Alsace-Lorraine to Prussia in 1871 after the Franco-Prussian War, led to pressure on the French government to make new land available in Algeria for about 5,000 Alsatian and Lorrainer refugees who were resettled there. During the 1870s, both the amount of European-owned land and the number of settlers were doubled, and tens of thousands of unskilled Muslims, who had been uprooted from their land, wandered into the cities or to colon farming areas in search of work. Topic. Comte and colonialism in the Third Republic Topic. Kabylie insurrection The most serious native insurrection since the time of Abd al-Qadir broke out in 1871 in the Kabylie and spread through much of Algeria. The revolt was triggered by Cremieux's extension of civil that is, colon, authority to previously self-governing tribal reserves and the abrogation of commitments made by the military government, but it had its basis in more long-standing grievances. Since the Crimean War 1854 the demand for grain had pushed up the price of Algerian wheat to European levels. Storage silos were emptied when the world market's impact was felt in Algeria, and Muslim farmers sold their grain reserves — including seed grain — to speculators. But the community-owned silos were the fundamental adaptation of a subsistence economy to an unpredictable climate, and a good year's surplus was stored away against a bad year's dearth. When serious drought struck Algeria and grain crops failed in 1866 and for several years following, Muslim areas faced starvation, and with famine came pestilence. It was estimated that 20% of the Muslim population of Constantine died over a three-year period. In 1871 the civil authorities repudiated guarantees made to tribal chieftains by the previous military government for loans to replenish their seed supply. This act alienated even pro-French Muslim leaders, while it undercut their ability to control their people. 
It was against this background that the stricken Kabyles rose in revolt, following immediately on the mutiny in January 1871 of a squadron of Muslim Spahis in the French army who had been ordered to embark for France. The withdrawal of a large proportion of the army stationed in Algeria to serve in the Franco-Prussian War had weakened France's control of the territory, while reports of defeats undermined French prestige amongst the indigenous population. In the aftermath of the 1871 uprising, French authorities imposed stern measures to punish and control the whole Muslim population. France confiscated more than 5,000 square kilometers of tribal land and placed the Kabylie under a regimed exception extraordinary rule, which denied the due process guaranteed French nationals. A special indigenat native code listed as offences acts such as insolence and unauthorized assembly not punishable by French law, and the normal jurisdiction of the Kuda was sharply restricted. The Governor-General was empowered to jail suspects for up to five years without trial. The argument was made in defense of these exceptional measures that the French Penal Code as applied to Frenchmen was too permissive to control Muslims. Some were deported to New Caledonia, see Algerians of the Pacific. Topic. Conquest of the Southwestern Territories In the 1890s, the French administration and military called for the annexation of the Tuat, the Gorara and the Tidekilt, a complex that during the period prior to 1890, was part of what was known as Blad es Siba land of dissidents, those regions that were nominally Moroccan but which were not submitted to the authority of the central government, an armed conflict opposed French 19th Corps Oran and Algiers divisions to the 8 Kabash, a fraction of the 8 Aungi Khan of the Eight Atta Confederation. The conflict ended by the annexation of the Tuat Gorara Tidekilt complex by France in 1901. In the 1930s, the Sora Valley and the region of Tindouf were in turn annexed to French Algeria at the expense of Morocco, then under French protectorate since 1912. Topic: Conquest of the Sahara. The French military expedition, led by Lieutenant Colonel Paul Flatters, was annihilated by Tuareg attack in 1881. The French took advantage of long-standing animosity between Tuareg and Chamba Arabs. The newly raised company's Maristes were originally recruited mainly from the Chamba nomadic tribe. The Mariste Camel Corps provided an effective means of policing the desert. In 1902, Lieutenant Cottonist penetrated Hagar Mountains and defeated a Hagar Tuareg in the Battle of Tit. Topic: <laughs> During World War II, 1940 to 45. Colonial troops of French Algeria were sent to fight in metropolitan France during the Battle of France in 1940. After the fall of France, the Third French Republic collapsed and was replaced by the Philippe Pétain's French state, better known as Vichy France. Topic: <laughs> Under the Fourth Republic, 1946 to 58. Many Algerians had fought as French soldiers during the Second World War. Thus Algerian Muslims felt that it was even more unjust that their votes were not equal to those of the other Algerians, especially after 1947 when the Algerian Assembly was created. This assembly was composed of 120 members. Algerian Muslims, representing about 6.85 million people, could designate 50% of the assembly members, while 1,150,000 non-Muslim Algerians could designate the other half. Moreover, a massacre occurred in Sedif May 8, 1945. It opposed Algerians who were demonstrating for their national claim to the French army. 
After skirmishes with police, Algerians killed about 100 French. The French army retaliated harshly, resulting in the deaths of approximately 6,000 Algerians. This triggered a radicalization of Algerian nationalists and could be considered the beginning of the Algerian War. In 1956, about 512,000 French soldiers were in Algeria. No resolution was imaginable in the short term. An overwhelming majority of French politicians were opposed to the idea of independence while independence was gaining ground in Muslim Algerians' minds. France was deadlocked and the Fourth Republic collapsed over this dispute. Topic. Under the Fifth Republic 1958 In 1958, Charles de Gaulle's return to power in response to a military coup in Algiers in May was supposed to keep Algeria's status quo as departments of France as hinted by his speeches delivered in Oran and Mostaganem on 6 June 1958, in which he exclaimed Vive l'Algérie française. Lit. Long live French Algeria. De Gaulle's Republican Constitution project was approved through the September 1958 referendum and the Fifth Republic was established the following month with de Gaulle as its president. The latter consented to independence in 1962 after a referendum on Algerian self-determination in January 1961 and despite a subsequent aborted military coup in Algiers led by four French generals in April 1961. Post-colonial relations Relations between post-colonial Algeria and France have remained close throughout the years, although sometimes difficult. In 1962, the Evian Accords Peace Treaty provided land in the Sahara for the French army, which it had used under de Gaulle to carry out its first nuclear tests Gerbois Bleu. Many European settlers Pied Noirs, living in Algeria and Algerian Sephardic Jews, who contrary to Algerian Muslims had been granted French citizenship by the Cremieux decrees at the end of the 19th century, were expelled to France where they formed a new community. On the other hand, the issue of the Harkis, the Muslims who had fought on the French side during the war, still remained unresolved. Large numbers of Harkis were killed in 1962, during the immediate aftermath of the Algerian War, while those who escaped with their families to France have tended to remain an unassimilated refugee community. The present Algerian government continues to refuse to allow Harkis and their descendants to return to Algeria. On February 23, 2005, the French Law on Colonialism was an act passed by the Union for a Popular Movement um, conservative majority, which imposed on high school lycée teachers to teach the positive values of colonialism to their students, in particular in North Africa Article 4. The law created a public uproar and opposition from the whole of the left wing, and was finally repealed by President Jacques Chirac UMP at the beginning of 2006, after accusations of historical revisionism from various teachers and historians. Algerians feared that the French law on colonialism would hinder the task the French confronting the dark side of their colonial rule in Algeria because Article 4 of the law decreed among other things that school programs are to recognize in particular the positive role of the French presence overseas, especially in North Africa." Benjamin Stora, a leading specialist on French Algerian history of colonialism and a Pied Noir himself, said, "...France has never taken on its colonial history." It is a big difference with the Anglo-Saxon countries, where post-colonial studies are now in all the universities. We are phenomenally behind the times." In his opinion, although the historical facts were known to academics, they were not well known by the French public and this led to a lack of honesty in France over French colonial treatment of the Algerian people.
Topic: Algérie Française. Algérie Française was a slogan used about 1960 by those French people who wanted to keep Algeria ruled by France. Literally, French Algeria, it means that the three départements of Algeria were to be considered integral parts of France. By integral parts, it is meant that they have their deputies representatives in the French National Assembly, and so on. Further, the people of Algeria who were to be permitted to vote for the deputies would be those who universally accepted French law, rather than Sharia which was used in personal cases among Algerian Muslims under laws dating back to Napoleon III, and such people were predominantly of French origin or Jewish origin. Many who used this slogan were Ritternese. In Paris, during the perennial traffic jams, adherence to the slogan was indicated by sounding a car horn in the form of four telegraphic dots followed by a dash, as Al-Jay-Ri-Fran-Kays. Whole choruses of such horn soundings were heard. This was intended to be reminiscent of the Second World War slogan, V for Victory which had been three dots followed by a dash. The intention was that the opponents of Algérie Française were to be considered as traitorous as the collaborators with Germany during the occupation of France. Topic. See also List of colonial heads of Algeria History of Algeria History of France French space program International relations 1814 -1919. Le Chant des Africains Nationalism and resistance in Algeria Oran Exposition Scramble for Africa List of French possessions and colonies Catholic Youth Sports Associations of French Algeria